Um, we've got a fantastic panel now, um, and I would like to invite, um, well, first I'd like to introduce our moderator, Eleanor Allen. She is currently the CEO for Water for People, which is based in the United States. She's a world-leading water expert who's, been, who's dedicated her career to really providing access to safe drinking water and sanitation to in particularly the poor. Um, she has worked in many positions. She's worked both in Peace Corps, and she's also worked for companies such as CH2M Hill, Jacobs, and Arcadis. And at Arcadis, she held a very senior position. Um, as I said, she now works as the CEO for Water for People, and she's uh, been a business ex executive, and she's had extensive experience in water and sanitation throughout the world. She's worked in many, many countries. So without further ado, I'd like to invite Eleanor Allen to chair the panel. Thank you, Carla. <laughs> so I think, oh yes, I'm mic'd. So I'm going to introduce this incredible panel one by one, if you can join me when I introduce you. So first we have, I need my glasses here, we have uh, Roshan Raj Shrisa from the Gates Foundation. And Roshan is from Nepal originally, but he's living in Seattle now. He's the senior program officer and lead of the Urban Sanitation Markets. And previously he was a technical advisor at UN Habitat and he worked in the Water for Asian Cities program with water scarcity and sewage across the Asian continent. He's a PhD in Applied Sciences from the University of Natural Resources and Applied Life Sciences, Boku in Austria. And he favors the holistic approach to sanitation and foresees that non-sewage sanitation septic management will speed up sanitation in Asia and Pacific region and, and Africa as well, as we've been talking about earlier today. So, Rafaela. Rafaela Matos is from uh, Portugal, and she is a principal researcher in hydraulics in the environmental department at the National Laboratory for Civil Engineering. Her work has covered the development of performance indicators for wastewater management, adaptive urban water management for climate change, and the sustainable management of urban water, among others. She's a member of the Portuguese Water Partnership, a prolific author and researcher, and a leader of H2020 Bingo, which is bringing innovation to ongoing water management, and on the advisory board of Klima 2050, um, the Norwegian uh, Center of Excellence, a climate change and built environment. And then we have Marcus Rink. Marcus is the chief inspector for the Drinking Water Inspectorate with nearly 30 years experience working in health environment and the water industry in the UK. He's been in the Drinking Water Inspectorate since 2002 and from 2008, he's been responsible for the operational regulation in England and Wales as the Deputy Chief Inspector. Mr. Rink is a UK member from the European Microbiology Expert Group and Chair of the Strategic Board of the Standing Committee of Analysts. And last, we have Rosie Ween. Rosie's uh, passionate about human rights, gender equality, and leadership. She's worked in development for two decades, including six years living and working in the Eastern Islands of Indonesia. She's worked at the at WaterAid Australia since its inception in 2004, and I learned she was the first employee. She was the director of international programs prior to becoming the chief executive in 2016. Rosie's leadership manifesto focuses on being an authentic servant leader and a commitment to pushing beyond her comfort zone in all aspects of her life. This is where she believes she learns most and performs her best. She's on the board of the Three Foundation and is a founder and committee member of the newly formed Not In My Workplace, a group of executive leaders working to address workplace harassment and abuse across all industries in Victoria. And she's recently discovered adventure and obstacle racing, I'd like to hear about that, and electric bikes, which keep her sane and healthy, and she's a proud mom of two boys. So, this amazing panel, we are gonna have a uh, conversation and reflect on Silver's talk and I'd like to think about all these uh, different experiences you all have. What do we um, still face in strengthening and expanding our institutions in the water sector to reach and maintain sustainable development goal number six? So I'd like to hear from each of you about your thoughts in the area of regulation, people, and institution building. And I have a few specific questions that I'm going to ask. and We can have a conversation. And I'm gonna start with Marcus as our regulatory expert. So when, when you reflected on uh, Silver's talk, how do you see the role of regulation changing in low and middle income economies in light of SDG 6? 
Yes, I mean, uh, I'd like to start off by saying that. Um, oh, we need a microphone for you. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, can you? Yeah. Start? Okay, okay. So uh, I'd like to start off by saying that uh, I'm a water quality regulator, and, and uh, one of my uh, objectives, or my primary objectives, is the production of a safe, clean water. And so the Strategic Development Goal 6 really um, is uh, complementary to uh, the objective of uh, me and my organisation and, and the support that we give uh, throughout the world uh, together with uh, the World Health Organisation. And it's uh, probably another thing that's worth uh, thinking about is, uh, as a regulator, uh, we might be seen as, uh, as a police force which is intended to, to, uh, to hit uh, organisations to meet these goals. But you need to put this in context. What we try to do is look at a, a, a strategic long-term outcome. Uh, we look at uh, the uh, countries that uh, perhaps we're uh, helping, and we want to work with them to provide the right um, uh, stepping stones to the out objective of producing safe, clean drinking water. So that uh, often is the provision of advice, guidance, uh, discussing with politicians, creating the bridge between uh, 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 politicians and policy makers and uh, putting in place enforcement, putting in place guidance and putting in place the uh, opportunity for companies to meet those requirements over a long period of time. So um, regulation and water quality regulation is a relatively new thing. Uh, we have uh, been ourselves uh, as the drinking water inspectorate less than 30 years uh, in the United Kingdom and uh, many countries don't have a water quality uh, regulator they uh, rely on the Department of Health or, or water companies as a whole and and we feel that uh, by working together with uh, policymakers and water companies we can put in learning from different countries into those uh, uh, companies to allow and project safe drinking water quality. Thank you, Marcus. I think we know in some countries where we work, and um, there might be regulations actually written, but not necessarily enforced. And this is also an area of growing, but still very challenging. And so, Rosie, what about in your experience at WaterAid and uh, generally working in the countries where you work and um, developing services in water and sanitation? Have you seen shifts recently or changes in institutional strengthening and regulation in the countries where you work? Yeah, thanks, Eleanor, and, and thanks again, Silva, for that really inspiring uh, speech and, and presentation. And I think, Eleanor, regulation is a really key part of sector strengthening, but to date, I think it's been neglected. So it, we are seeing some shifts uh, towards more of an emphasis on regulation and its importance. And I've been lucky enough to visit Kampala and see some of the work uh, by Silva's team uh, and visit some of the pro-poor meters where people are able to get access to safe drinking water and really able to transform their lives because they're not playing the previously incredibly inflated prices. And I was particularly struck uh, by something that one of Silva's staff said, and we saw how engaged and focused they are on the mission. And they said, serving the poor is not about putting in infrastructure, but about the mechanisms you use to keep those systems working. And I think that really emphasizes the role that regulation plays uh, to keep those systems working. Another great example that I've seen is also from Africa, from West Africa and Burkina Faso, where the government there has enshrined the right to water and sanitation in their constitution and also the regulatory framework. And this is a really important <coughs> shift that we're seeing where the right to water and sanitation is informing regulatory frameworks. In Burkina Faso, I think it's particularly pleasing because there's the emphasis not just on water, but also on sanitation. Um, and also I would like to flag, there's a great opportunity to hear more about the human rights of water and sanitation uh, through the IWA launch of the manual in French. So that'll be a key chance to discuss that further then. Great, thanks Rosie. So I loved hearing about people. Mm -hmm. And Silver, you also mentioned the performance indicators, which is super interesting. And I'm familiar with some of the work at National Water about the incentives. 
So I was thinking as we think about the, our sector and water and sanitation and all of us here, knowing we need to approximately double by 2030 to meet SDG number six, just to be able to do the work that's being planned with all this new infrastructure being built. Um, bringing people to the sector has been hard already, but it's just going to continue to be a challenge. So especially in sanitation, I'm thinking, Roshan, about you and your work. It's not necessarily the career that some people aspire to get into, although some of us that are in the field, of course, think it's the best in the world. Um, so what about the demand as the sanitation services are increasing globally? What about the demand for the work? And what examples have you seen uh, through your work at the Gates Foundation about attracting people either young professionals or small businesses into the sector in the countries where you work. Thank you. Yeah, of course, uh, sanitation is still... It's on. on. Yeah, you're good. Uh, sanitation is still an uh, issue that we need to address. But I can see in a couple of years back, since like five, six years, if you see that time, and we used to talk about the toilet, we used to talk about pipe, sewer system, and so on. And there is no attraction. People talk, when we talk shit, so who really cares? Nobody likes to talk the shit, nobody likes to listen to shit. The shit is not like a, you know, the attraction in the past. In the past, I mean, just six, seven years, five six, five, six years back. So now, at least the mindset of the people, of professionals at least, slowly changing their mindset. Seat is a business. <laughs> so seat is a business, then there is some attraction. What the business there is. So that, that, that converted slowly. Of course, still takes some time. After SDG, even that really bring another issue like the, we need to talk about the service. It's not like coverage. So sanitation service. So we are talking about we need to achieve the sanitation services, better sanitation services to the all. Reach poor everybody. So that means, you know, that when we talk about service, then I agree with uh, you that what uh, my colleague from Rose, 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 when she was talking about, like the building infrastructure is not a solution for the poor, it's more service. If you provide services, then definitely they will have better service, uh, better sanitation facility. So in that sense, you know, the, the th things are changing, but of course we need professionals. We have limited professionals. Now, if you see the old school's colleague who really working uh, since last 20, 30 years in the sector, they don't know the, all those business models, service models, whatever you are talking about, sanitation. But now slowly since it's emerging and then the young professionals are coming in. Just, I want to give example, our dummy is sitting there, IHE uh, colleague who also got award. <laughs> uh, so they come up with the new course on sanitation. Scientists and masters, and new, new, new scientists and master course. And when they close the admission, then more than 1,800 students, they apply. And from 90 countries, that means there's the interest. Similarly, there are a lot of online courses now running on, and thousands of those young professionals are admitted there. So because they, so they have seen that there is business. That's why what I'm say, seeing here is, now we have to really change the way how we talk about scientists, then definitely we can increase science and profile, and we need, really need to show the lot of business opportunity on sanitation. We are talking about reinventing toilet, so total, total different toilet system. Similarly, we were talking about the sludge management from their agriculture, fertilizer, all those things, produce production, everything coming up. So I think I'm very much hopeful, and in next generation, definitely, uh, we will not have the problem that what we are saying now. Thank you, Roshan. So the uh, shit business is growing, that's good news. So uh, what about the clean water side, Rafaela? You, you working in hydraulics in, in Portugal and at the National Lab, and you've worked a lot on developing performance indicators for utilities. And what have you learned about performance indicators with respect to the management, particularly in low and middle income countries? And what about growing talent in the sector in these countries? Thank you, Eleanor. Hello, everybody. Um, when I look back, really for the work that we've done for IWA PI system, 20 years are already passed. And um, I think the main added value of this IWA work done, started by Elena Alec 
Rommel Neck as well, and then followed by, by myself with, a, with a, a, a great team, was really to have a mainframe for performance assessment that shift from just a technological and uh, infrastructure point of view for a more global uh, approach, dealing with people, with staff, with institutional aspects. And this global framework did not exist before, so this was really the starting, the starting point. And the idea, the objective was to set this uh, global framework, complemented by a set of PIs, a huge number of PIs, that were able to, to see like a menu, to, to show up like a menu, to be customized by others in, in several points of the world. And uh, the objective of this um, approach was on one side to have a framework to improve the behavior within an utility or an institution, a regulatory body, to compare, allow for comparison among several institutions, and also to, from people starting from the scratch, to have a kind of a roadmap. So this is how I see the starting point since 20 years. After the manuals were published, a lot of initiatives pop up all over the world. Um, and I think with a lot of success stories. I probably don't know every, every success story, but if I may refer some that, that I know, I would point it out the India case, where we had this uh, couple, uh, Mir and Danish Meta, with the PASS Performance Assessment System Initiative in Gujarat and in Ma Maharashtra, that for sure impacted a lot of people. And this was dealing with water supply and, and sanitation and the full value chain. We have also uh, initiatives in Malaysia, in China. China is no more uh, a middle income country, I think it's upper middle. But in China, in Beijing water, we had also an interesting initiatives uh, on, on, on PI for water supply and, and wastewater. We have also some interesting experience with regulators, for instance, in Albania and Kosovo in Europe. In Mozambique, my home country, also from the side of the regulator. Uh, and in South America, with Adrasa in Buenos Aires. And the EWI, EWI PIs were also the basis, the foundation for the World Bank IBNet, that of course impacted all over the world. So there were a lot of initiatives uh, around in this uh, last, last years. The manuals were translated in several languages. For instance, uh, the, the water supply in French, in Spanish, in Japanese, in Iranian, and more recently in Chinese. So this was really something that EWA did, did very well to, to spread around the, the information. And uh, the wastewater manual was also at the, at the recent uh, Chinese uh, version. So these reports translated in several languages, all these initiatives po that pop up with their reports were for sure a great inspiration for a lot of people and also a lot of students and young, and young professionals. Just to a final note, if I, may, if I may say, the PI approach is still very alive and it is increasing. We see applications in uh, water treatment and wastewater treatment plants. We see application in strategic asset management. We see application in uh, decentralized sanitation. Um, we see also that the ISO standards are now dealing with this matter that is also a, a very good point to, to, to spread up uh, the, the, the information. And I see also that in this IWA Congress, we have a lot of sessions dealing with benchmarking of utilities, mm -hmm. with the PIs comparing uh, utilities and, and cities and benchmarking. So I think it's well alive and uh, we'll have uh, good years uh, uh, ahead. Excellent, thank you, Rafaela. So Silver, I have a question for you on people now that we're on the people topic. You touched on people in your presentation, but I'm curious in Uganda, bringing young professionals into the utility sector. 
do you have programs or partnerships with the universities, or what's your attraction method for getting them to want to work for National Water? Okay, we have uh, young water professionals. I saw the young man, he's here taking photos there. <laughs> he's actually the president of the young water professionals. And these guys are very serious. They are planting trees, they are teaching people sanitation issues, they have introduced the school water and sanitation clubs in schools, and with the whole objective of teaching young people to understand matters of environmental protection, matters of how to use water, and also matters of hygiene promotion. So, so, and so we have them inside the corporation, in the universities, and also in other institutions. So, so for us, that's a very, very good mechanism of succession planning, that you have a young generation that is, is appreciating all these issues. So that when some of us grow old, they can easily, they can easily take over. They're getting ready to take over, yes. <laughs> so <laughs> but, uh, leading from our people to the institutions, and Silver, you touched on this about building these institutions and um, looking for ways to not be inefficient and not have real role duplication. As we look to get countries to full coverage and keeping the services sustainable so everyone uh, keeps a high quality of life, we know that we need to build resilient institutions and systems and that are reliable. So this is about a regulation and about people and about financing and long-term planning. So Rosie, I'm thinking about you and WaterAid and um, watching communities over the long-term change in a level of service to, from having none or not reliable to having good services. What have you experienced and how can you attribute that into institutional strengthening to keep the services going? Thanks. I think that's a really great link, as you were just saying, to people. And as you said in your presentation, Silver, our institutions, our organizations are our people. And I think the power that we have as the global water industry and the people of the water industry is to get better at selling the careers that you have, that we have, because what we do changes people's lives. As Silver described, a head isn't for carrying water, it's for, for thinking, and the work of providing clean water and basic sanitation changes lives so people aren't wasting time, particularly women and girls collecting water so that girls can stay in school when there is water and toilets because they have somewhere safe and dignified to manage their periods. So the, the work that we do can really attract great people into our organizations. And the institution building work that I see is central to connecting people with people. So a great example is uh, in Ethiopia, one of the nearly 40 countries where WaterAid works. So in Ethiopia, we've had a partnership with Yorkshire Water and WaterAid. And we've been working in 20 cities in Ethiopia. And very much as you described, they're facing huge challenges around really being stretched in their capacity. And so how can they build the capacity of their people? And so in these 20 towns since 2014, there's been a program looking somewhat similar to as the governor of Tokyo described. My um, Japanese isn't great, but the head, uh, mind, and spirit, uh, sorry, the mind, body, and skill, the Shingi Tai, really focusing on governance skills, on technical skills, and the, the human resource capacity building. And what we're seeing is tremendous results in these 20 cities. One of these uh, cities has in itself hosted another 160 towns that have come to visit and see the work that they're doing as a result of the capacity building of the institution, of the people. <clears throat> and we've, the investment that we've made in that has been relatively small, one million pounds, compared to the investment by others, by other 
uh, banks and the government of Ethiopia, they've invested 45 million pounds as a result of the strengthening of the capacity building. And I think this signals the way to end that song that you were singing of donors, donors, the song of the day, is to really strengthen the capacity. And it is only with that that we will achieve the sustainable development goals. And I think this really shows the power of partnerships uh, and also uh, the power of the people, as I said at the outset, of the water industry and how we can connect up globally to achieve the sustainable development goals. We've only got 4,488 days left, so we really do need to have a sense of urgency. Thank you for that pressure for the time. The clock keeps ticking. So one thing we haven't touched on uh, yet, but I'd like to hear from the panelists about institution building with related to extreme weather and climate change. There's things happening at home in the US right now that are unprecedented. So I know, Rafael, you're a, one of your areas of expertise is climate change adaptation. And what about utilities in this area and global management and taking this into account um, within water resources management and part of their institutional strengthening? What, what have you seen in your experience? Yeah, um, thank you again, uh, Eleanor. As you referred, I'm working now more in, uh, in, in Europe on, on cities and uh, climate adaptation against uh, resilience against hydroclimate risks. But what I can say, um, what I see around the world is that first, there is a huge awareness growing on the topic, and this is very positive. And everybody's also feeling that there's a huge need for action. So the sense of urgency is also now much more clear. There is also a very positive growing of exchange of experiences. So this, this is good because this can be a shortcut to, 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 to the point. On the other hand, there are also huge funds and investments for climate change adaptation, where the water and the sanitation can benefit from, namely to achieve SDG 6, but also SDG 13 uh, climate change. So these are all good news. For the, just to give an example, in my, again, in my home, uh, the country where I, where I was born in Mozambique, the master drainage plan, the metropolitan master drainage plan for Maputo was developed under the climate uh, adaptation plan of, of World Bank. So there are a lot of uh, possibilities uh, by now. Two main messages in my understanding that are really important for low and, and middle income countries. First, the reality of the peri-urban cities, the slums. They are growing and growing more than the cities themselves they have 80, 90% of the population of the city. And when there are extreme events, like floods, these people cannot escape. So they are really squeezed in, in, the pla in place. And more than this, when this, there is flooding, the flooding lichiviates uh, the, the sludge from the latrines. So there are huge problems of health, of quality uh, in, in the place. So you can, have, you can spread cholera. So I do believe that um, a big um, priority is to take care of the peri-urban areas. That is a reality that we don't have so much in, in, in other countries. Um, also, in these areas, the role of education, capacity building, institutional strengthening that we have uh, uh, referred so much here, governance overall, it's even more needed than in others. Because in upper middle countries, you have a, a vertical structure where you, from government to the citizen. But in these places, the government cannot reach to the people. So more and more, the local uh, arena is, is needed. So the playing role of education and capacity building is extremely, extremely important. When you invest in infrastructure, if you do not invest at the mm -hmm. same time on, uh, on capacity building and education, there will, be, there will be no return of this investment. So this is, in my point of view, a key, key message. 
Just a piece of, of information, if I, if I am made to conclude, uh, for those that don't know, we are now creating in Lisbon, where I live, uh, the Lees Water. Lees Water is an international center of excellence mm. that got already some funds from the European Commission. And the center is for public policies and regulation on water and water resources, uh, uh, related water resources. And the aim of Lees Water is exactly to tackle this huge challenge. How do you internalize, how do you transfer knowledge, innovation, and research to capacity building, to strategic advising, to entrepreneurship, and to society engagement? The logo of Lees Water is a butterfly or is a flower. You, you, you see what you want. <laughs> And, the, and the, the, the significant is really this, from the core to the petals, from inside to, to the flies of these uh, aspects where you have to, to, to transfer. I do hope that you heard uh, in the near future about Lee's Water, and we have, we'll have a, a homepage, and uh, I do hope uh, this will contribute to fill this, uh, this gap that is so important to achieve the, 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 the strategic goals and everything. Thank, Thank you. you. Rafaela, you mentioned something that I'd like Marcus to build on a bit, which is the urban slums, the low income areas. Lots of people moving in and we're not quite there with water quality. So I'm curious about um, how we, uh, it's a big challenge in my work too, is delivering water quality is just a challenge globally. And are there innovations, Marcus, or things that you know about that are, more accessible for low and middle income countries for water quality testing and uh, training for institutions that can help provide that high level of water quality? Uh, yes, uh, from a water quality point of view, I'm, I'm a great believer in big data uh, and understanding where the challenges are. Uh, I see this as a multi-faceted, multi-strategical uh, objective uh, in putting uh, water safety plans in place to make sure that uh, appropriate uh, assessment and care of uh, the sources of water are um, uh, of the best quality possible, but also um, then carrying out surveillance uh, of that uh, with uh, testing that is accessible. Uh, for developed nations, that's a relatively easy thing because mm -hmm. you have laboratories, you have uh, trained staff, you have transport, and the majority of costs associated with that are transport, people, and infrastructure, uh, laboratories, and, and that may not exist. And one of the things that uh, I, I was reading about was that uh, regulation is sometimes thought to block uh, innovation in water quality testing, and, and, and I think that's, that's um, a fallacy. I think um, uh, regulation's about working with the uh, circumstances that you find yourself in building on that and then being able to develop that. So if you have portable tests, whether they're chemistry or microbiological tests, uh, which you can gain di uh, data from, that gives you an idea of your prioritization. So there's clear um, uh, chemical testing that's easy, colorimetric, uh, photometric, uh, chemical strip, uh, test strips and so on, where you can test for nitrate and fluoride and uh, chlorine and so on. Microbiological testing is a little bit yeah, more difficult, and yet it's the most important part of it because in the um, more remote areas, that is really where you need to focus on. That's where you really need to understand. You really need to understand what kind of water supply you have. And in the cases where there is flooding or rainfall or disaster, um, uh, testing that's sufficiently rapid. So it's important to have uh, a low cost, easily uh, accessible, easy usable without uh, specialist knowledge uh, that can be done in the field without um, uh, laboratories or incubators. And, and we're starting to see um, a, an increase in that. It's, it's almost uh, looking at a technology that was used 20 years ago, um, but advancing on that and making it innovative. So we've seen, uh, uh, for instance, uh, multiple tube techniques, um, plates, um, and uh, filter uh, membranes, which have been adapted into, into mobile kits. So now you can carry out filtration in the field. Excellent. You can carry out uh, a simple test where you put it into a bag and it has a chromogenic uh, medium in there. 
um, uh, without the need for uh, UV technologies. You might not have electricity. You might not have um, uh, anything to incubate it. And so it's nice to see some innovation in uh, a test in the bag. that You can pop it in, uh, see the changes of color, and that gives you a clear understanding that you have coliforms or E. coli, uh, where you can take photographs of that through your mobile phone technology, and that then gives you a clear picture where your priorities are and where, for instance, um, there may be a disaster looming. Excellent. So in some of the tests, particularly some of the gel uh, chromogenic techniques where you're uh, pushing through uh, in a filter and, and looking at the change in colour of the filter, you can sensibly uh, get an understanding of gross contamination within an hour or two hours and you can communicate that back. Now that gives a, a real opportunity to stop disasters happening. Um, and be also proactive. So once you gather that data, you can then send out your resource to provide the guidance, uh, the training, the help, redigging wells, protecting wells, okay. not just improving the wells, but um, uh, making the wells such that it will produce safe quality water. Because after all, that is what our objective, it's right. producing right. safe water. Thank you, Marcus. Okay, we're out of time here. Just one last question for Roshan to close up our panel here. I'm curious for your perspective on institutional strengthening as a foundation. You play a unique role. You can convene others. You can bring together civil society and government and private partners. So where do you see that going with um, regards to getting institutions stronger? Uh, yeah, uh, our role is to play the facilitation role. For example, main thing is uh, there are a lot of best practices are available. And Dr. Silva, people like Dr. Silva and many other colleagues who are really champion, we need to really bring it up there. And we are actually helping to, uh, working with a couple of the institutions who are really uh, mobilizing a lot of institutions like the ESOHASA from the Africa, similarly uh, several, con several uh, countries in, in South Asia, for example, likely working with the government and bringing the issues uh, there. And then the main thing is how to really learn each other and uh, how to establish a lot of training programs so that the best practices can be transferred to other cities. For example, uh, Kampala can be one of the basic examples that Dr. Silva is saying, so that practice needs to be transferred to others. And then the institutional setup and regulation cannot be really happen easily. We need to really show the people how this is going. And for that purpose, we are working with the development partner, development bank, and government city authorities uh, to work together and uh, we are playing the playing kind of facilities, facilitated role to, to bring these issues uh, in, in, on the ground. Excellent, thank you. I'd like to thank all my panelists and keynote speaker and please join me in giving a round of applause to this excellent panel.